Hi everyone, this is the final video component for chapter 7, which is about attachment. Now remember, attachment comes from ethological theory, the study of animals, the study of behavior, relationships. So they used to focus on baby birds, right? They would look at why do baby birds follow their mothers? Is it instinctual? Is it for another reason? And what we determined, again, is it's for survival. So what is attachment? How does it get started? I like to think of what are synonyms for attachment? Bond, connection, relationship. So attachment, again, is something that is lifelong. These relationships can be formed and endure over space and time. They can last forever. So they're very important in how they're structured. Now, Bowlby is our first theorist that we're going to focus on for attachment. He focused on the bond between an infant and their mother primarily. Then he expanded that into caregivers and other um, besides just mothers. But one of his concepts was the internal working model. What he believed is children have this contraption within their brain that based on all of the experiences we go through, this internal working model determines expectations of care. What is a mom? What is a dad? What is a sister? What is a son? What is a brother? The child develops these schemes within their brain and expectations of what they view those roles at. What does a mom need to do in that child's mind? What does a dad need to do? And it's based completely on their experiences. So think about that. That's going to affect all their future relationships. If you had a strong female mother, that's going to affect how you look at mothers in the future. What about if you're a female who's looking for a male partner and in your life, all males have been negative, aggressive, violent? You may place that expectation onto males in your life. So again, our initial attachments and our initial relationships are so important because they affect all of our future relationships with peers, significant others, teachers, our own children, and ongoing throughout all of life. Now, please watch the video that I put on Blackboard about Bowlby and his initial influences on the theory. Now, here's a breakdown of his phases of attachment. Now, those aren't stages because he believed once you reach the final phase, you're in that phase for the rest of your life. So he broke down the first two years of life into four phases of the development of attachment. Now, these phases follow a very biological age breakdown, right? You can see birth to six weeks, six weeks to six to eight months, six months to about two years and then two years and onward. So what I want you to remember is the two things that happen underneath each phase. So in pre-attachment, children or infants signal for their needs to be met, right? They are very young infants. So they're going to smile, they're going to cry, they're going to show their needs. But the second part of that is they're indiscriminate. They don't really care who takes care of them as long as their needs are met, which is why that's such a great time for children to be adopted because they haven't yet formed bonds with their primary caregivers. They're only under six weeks old. But then for the next few months of life, from about six weeks to six to eight months, they're going through two more things. Number one, they're showing preference for a caregiver because they're developing trust with that caregiver. So they start to show that they want that person. They start to, again, reach for them and prefer them over other caregivers. Then the third phase is clear-cut attachment. The child by this point is clearly attached to their primary caregivers. They go through things like anxiety, stranger anxiety, separation anxiety, 
when they're away from that caregiver because again, that caregiver is their go-to person. Now, they'll explore their environment, but their caregiver, again, is the secure base. So what does secure base mean? It's kind of like a security item for young children. They feel comfortable exploring their environment up to a point, and they'll go back to their secure base for emotional support as needed. So think about a young child, a one-year-old, who's going to a park for the first time. They're probably going to connect back to that secure base of their parent multiple times over the time at the park because they've never been there before. They don't know the other children. They don't know how to use the contraptions. So they're going to rely heavily on their secure base for emotional support. Now, fast forward three years down the line and you have your four-year-old at the park. He knows that the parent is there if he needs them, but he knows the park now. So he's going to go back to his parent less and less for emotional support, but that parent is still the secure base if needed for the child for any type of issue. So again, that's what secure base is, and we'll see that as we talk about Ainsworth in just a few minutes. Now, the fourth and final phase is the formation of a reciprocal relationship a two-way relationship. And once children reach this at two years old, they now have the understanding of what you need to form a relationship. They can express what they need and what they want. And the parent or other person in the relationship can also express what they need and what they want. They are now able to form relationships. So now think about these phases of attachment. We've talked previously about sensitive periods, right? So this is a sensitive period. Children will go through these phases and they won't even know what's happening. It will be natural and it's just a natural part of what goes along with their biological age. But let's say you have a child after the age of two who's trying to be adopted. They will then have a stronger and more, they'll have to put in more effort to be in that relationship. And again, because they're out of that sensitive period, it does not mean that that attachment can't be formed. It's just now going to be a little bit more difficult and require a little bit more effort. Okay, so now let's get into Mary Ainsworth and her contribution. So those phases was Bowlby. Bowlby saw that there was a way that we developed our connection to others, so he came up with those phases. Well, Ainsworth looked at Bowlby's theory and thought, that's a great theory, but when I'm looking at different relationships, I'm seeing very different bonds. I'm seeing some that appear healthy. I'm seeing some that appear unhealthy. So Mary Ainsworth put the security to attachment. Now, what she did to develop this was something called the strange situation. And if you look here, there's eight different events that the child and or parent are going to go through. But look at what they're actually observing in terms of the attachment behavior. Is the parent being looked at as a secure base? Is the child going through anxiety? How is the child able to be soothed by a stranger? What is the reaction when the parent comes back? So they're looking at this in eight different episodes, right? They put the parent and child together. They have the parent leave. They have a stranger come. They have the parent come back. They have the uh, child alone. And again, they're constantly looking at the child's reactions. How are they reacting towards the parent, towards the stranger? and even in just their own initial interactions with themselves. So what Mary Ainsworth found was children either fell into secure attachment based on her observation of the strange situation, or they fell into one of the insecure categories, which are avoidant, resistant, and disorganized, disoriented. And notice the percentage. Most children fall under the secure style of attachment. 
but we do have a small number that falls into one of the three categories of insecure attachment. So similar to Bowlby and his four phases, you need to remember that Ainsworth has four types and you need to remember two things under each type. Number one, what is the child's behavior? Number two, what is the caregiver or parent's behavior? So in a secure style of attachment, we see that the child will be upset when their parent leaves, but is easily comforted when their parent comes back, usually will immediately stop crying, and they look to their caregiver as a secure, a secure base when they're playing together and look for cues when exploring. Now that's the child's behaviors. What are the caregiver's behaviors? The caregiver is a sensitive and quality caregiver. They're sensitive to what the child needs, and therefore, notice, the child then has a secure style of attachment. So the child's behaviors are actually very similar to the caregiver's behaviors. When the caregiver is sensitive and quality, then the child has a secure style of attachment with that caregiver. Now look at avoidant. What does that mean? The child is going to avoid the caregiver, whether they are there, leaving, or returning to the room. Now, why would a baby avoid their caregiver? Possibly because the caregiver has a history of being insensitive to that child, so they're not in tune to their needs. Maybe they reject the child or somewhat avoid the child in the first place. Well, then the child will act in a very similar way and will avoid the parent. Now, resistant children act in a two-way type of behavior. In one way, they're clingy and they're whiny and they're pulling for their parent's support. But once they get it, they start pushing the parent away and actually, you know, seem to want to get away from the parent. So why would they have this kind of weird behavior where they want the care, but they don't want it at the same time? Possibly because the caregiver has been inconsistent with the child. Sometimes they want the child to come sit with them and let's be loving. And other times they're pushing the child away and being inconsistent with their care. This can also happen with passive parenting. When we constantly don't make things a big deal or don't show children, you know, what is right and what is wrong, the child will kind of act out in this resistant style of attachment. Now, the last style is disorganized, disoriented, and most commonly the caregiver or someone in the child's life may be abusive. The child then acts out in a contradictory type of way. They're either dazed and depressed and kind of, you know, zoning out or are having these unexpected outbursts that seem kind of out of the ordinary for the child. So again, all of these are kind of signs of whether the child has a secure style of attachment or an insecure style of attachment with their primary caregivers. Now please make sure to watch the videos about the different styles of attachment. And here is a kind of breakdown again of by culture or by, you know, country, what is the breakdown? Again, primarily children fall under secure, but we do have a few of the avoidant or resistant or disorganized, disoriented. Now, how is attachment related to other areas? Well, we see secure attachment is many times related to positive outcomes for children when they get to preschool and middle childhood. Again, they have an easier time interacting with peers, their teacher, they're more easygoing. But continuity of caregiving, again, is going to affect their later relationships. If they have positive, secure attachments, they're probably going to have positive and secure attachments with their peers and with their significant others. But the opposite is also true, right? The effects of their early attachment again, are conditional. What about their future relationships? If they had a negative um, experience, that could also affect them negatively in the future. Now, 
can children move from one style of attachment to the other or vice versa, right? Could they be a securely attached child who then becomes insecurely attached? Well, of course, right? Think about life circumstance. What if the child and mother are bonding? It's going great. <clears throat> the security is, it, it's again, secure. And then the mother loses her spouse. He just, something drastic happens. That could, of course, affect her relationship with her baby. Maybe she is no longer able to really care for that baby and becomes avoidant or passive. That could then change the style of attachment. Now, factors that affect whether, you know, we're securely or insecurely attached is, again, the consistency and the availability of early caregivers. What was the quality of our caregiving? Who was the infant? Was the infant an easy temperament baby or difficult? What are the family circumstances? Again, was there a death in the family, homelessness, multiple children, um, what was the parents' internal working models? What was their own view of what a mother or father or child, son, daughter should be? So all of that plays into the relationships that we form with our caregivers. Now, what about child care and attachment? So again, the balance of work and caregiving can play into um, how well a child is securely attached, but they do find that Many times children can have benefits from high quality childcare, but if they're in childcare for a long amount of time and it's not quality, that can lead to more behavior problems, which then can again affect attachment. So how can we best predict attachment? Should we interview a mother or should we just observe the child in their play? Well, what we find is the mother's going to give us the best inkling on how she approaches the child and her parenting. That'll kind of give us an idea of what will their formation of attachment look like. Now, we form multiple attachments, right? Not just mothers, but fathers, siblings, grandparents. So we're going to look at a few of those here. What about fathers? Again, fathers and their sensitivity towards caregiving also predicts the security of attachment, but we find that they build through sensitive play. This affects, again, positive father caregiving is just as important as mothers. Here's work time spent with children under the age of 12. You can see that it's increasing with both mothers and fathers under the age of 30, over the age of 30, um, now compared to, well, again, not now, 2008, compared to, you know, 30 years before that. So it's important to look at the trends and we're noticing, yes, we need to spend more time and as much time as possible with our young children. What about siblings? Here's my siblings, again, goofing off, being identical twins, but it can be difficult when we have an arrival of a new baby. And with my twins, their case, they had each other all the time. So they didn't get a lot of alone time, right? So you might want to um, spend time with both children, spend time with each children individually, handle the misbehavior patiently because it's going to happen. Talk about the baby's wants and needs with the older child. Express positive emotions towards your partner. Don't take it out on your partner. Again, show them how to interact by how you interact with your partner and engage in the problem solving. Lastly, we have grandparents, right? They can be just as important with children and sometimes are their primary caregivers. They many times take over in times of stress. Maybe the parent is dealing with a drug addiction, a mental health issue, uh, is incarcerated. So it can be difficult. Again, not only are they forming this bond with a young child, but they're dealing with their own child's, you know, stresses of what's going on. So we want to consider these relationships. And again, think about how many children are exposed to these relationships and are still forming positive and healthy security in their attachments. Thank you. Please go back to Blackboard and watch all the videos.